powerpoint or anything that you want to share yeah yes, you have a powerpoint okay okay so you, i yeah. think you you can share that um you, uh, you why don't you try uh, you want to share it right at the beginning the powerpoint yeah yeah right yeah. from the beginning okay so why don't you try, why don't you just uh, yeah try sharing it and get that started and uh, okay. once you're ready we'll start i'll start the timer okay, sure. once you're ready yeah okay Sure. Okay. So, first, shall I start? You I'm want ready. to start now? Okay, just one yeah, second. Yeah, yeah, Let me just start the timer. Okay. So, so Pastor, can you see my screen? Yeah, I can see your screen. Yeah, yeah topic yeah, sure. on being a true leader. Okay, I can see your screen. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. yeah, yeah, Aaron, just go ahead. Your time starts now. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, good morning, everyone. So today my topic is on uh, true leaders. So today uh, I will be sharing some uh, insights about. The uh, true leader in their status and some challenges they face in a secular world. And lastly, I'm going to share about the uh, how are we going to uh, improve the status of a true leader. So uh, here are some. So, so uh, here is about a true leader. When we hear about the true leader, so uh, I, I have collected uh, two points about the true leader. So. So uh, first point is uh, a true leader is a one who humble enough to admit their mistakes. You, you know, even in a good times and even even in a bad times, they used to uh, they they always used to uh, admit to mis mistakes. So uh, the second point is uh, a true leader produce more uh, leaders, and uh, this is the definition about a true leader. So a true leader makes an effort to help. Uh, to help develop and the team's skills, so uh, so 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 they can reach their full potential. So uh, so like I mentioned before, like uh, today I'm going to be sharing about these uh, three three topics. Uh, like number one, true leader in the status, and secondly, and second is uh, challenges faced by the true leader in the secular world, and thirdly, uh, lastly, I'll be sharing about improving the status of a true leader. So, um, yeah, a uh, true leader in this status. So, uh, like, there are far more uh, to be said about, you know, uh, when we hear about a true leader, you know, the mark of a true leader is, you know, uh, when he or she is willing to stick bold uh, course uh, of an action and, and the action inspire others to dream more and to learn more and to do more. And to become a more true leader, so uh, like, so was uh, so, as I was you know uh, researching and uh, collecting data from some leaders you know in a village in some villages in my hometown, the Kokchung. So uh, like uh, the advent of a Christianity in uh, in many villages in the Kokchung down, uh, you know there there were some, there are many people you know they uh, like. They, they were worshipping sun, moon, you know, and stars, river, etc., you know, without knowing the creator. So uh, they worship created things. So many, many of those, you know, uh, like made their daily existence, you know, changed by the God grace. So uh, when these uh, two couples, you know, uh, American missionaries, uh, E.T.W. Clark, they, they came to Neglin and they, you know, they planted the gospel. Uh, the good news of Jesus Christ, and today there are, uh, you know, more than thousands of committed true leaders, you know, who have accepted Christ and dedicated their life uh, to the Lord faithfully, and many of them are serving uh, across the world, and they started, you know, the journey carrying the flame of true leader in this that is among the society, church, and a uh, different kind of denomination, and. Uh, I heard that uh, from the grandparents that uh, grandchildren that uh, it was not easy for them, you know, to lead the people in the land of, you know, uh, new education, row in the belief. But uh, they were saying that uh, they serve God anyway, 
you know they 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 did they just serve God. So um, so being a true leader, you know, uh, our status is very important, you know, to the lost and to the uns unsafe society or different kind of you know denomination. Like even if, even in God's words, uh, it says that in Psalms one hundred and nineteen, it says Psalms one hundred nineteen verse fifty nine. I have considered my conduct, and I promise to follow your consider. So uh, through all the journey, they just, you know, uh, carrying the status of a true leader, they just, you know, uh, started igniting the gospel to the different parts of the villages. So, uh, like, like uh, secondly, here is uh, some challenges, you know, that the true leader usually used to face in the secular world. So, uh, you know, uh, it's very sad today that um, humility, you know, humility is often missing virtue in a secular world. And that's the very challenging, you know, uh, face in society with different kind of culture by a true leader. So because of a true leader, you know, a true leader used to take a lot of uh, like uh, courage to, to put others first, even though, you know, people don't realize how much they care for so like uh uh like uh, in the early days in 1952 uh like i was you know collecting some tatas from the elder from, from the forefathers uh reverend Rickon, you know he was he was the first pastor he was the first reverend in a, uh, in a village called Mamatung. and in his time you know uh like they were, they were, in his time, uh, our dialect Bible was not completed, uh, translated. They were saying something like that, okay? So, uh, uh, like, there were only four books, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And he, you know, he tried his best to share the stories, you know, uh, from, from, from these four books. And, but somehow, you know, uh, many people didn't accept his teaching, but, um, but he ate with humility uh, to his people. And today the outcomes of, you know, humility to the community has uh, spread all over the parts of Nagaland. So, um, yes. So, but uh, like, when we see in a general terms, you know, in a uh, today scenario, uh, there is a lack of humility, you know, uh, in between leaders and they are born, you know, to, to making avoidable mistakes, blaming each other for the poor decision. We can see the current situation in conflicts between Russia and Ukraine, you know. And there are lots of this behind the, conf uh, behind the battle, behind the war. But all we can see behind this war, behind these conflicts, is a lack of humility. So uh, it's very sad, you know, that today people think that, you know, we will take everything of, uh, after after we die physically. We will take everything after winning the wars and so on. But what God's word says that in First Timothy six seven says that for we brought nothing into the world and we can't take nothing out of it. So uh, like also we have when we look in the life of Jesus now, he is the perfect example of humility. A crazy, you know, it's a very crazy. Crazy to think about, you know, a king of king, you know, uh, lived his heavenly place and he chose to live in the broken world, you know, as a servant to all. And he gave us the best sacrifice on the cross, John 3, 16. So, you know, uh, it's it's very challenging for every leader, you know. So so here here is the thing, you know, what we need to change. Even though, you know, even though we are just one man army, leader of history, and, you know, come, they usually used to come and go, but true leaders still live in people's hearts and lives. So there is a need of, you know, a need for a true leader in our society. A true leader who is not, you know, only concerned about his or her family or tribes, but, you know, who is willing to forego. He, uh, his or her own interest for someone else and, you know, leader who honor God with humility. 
So with people, we are not, you know, we are, we are not saying that we are perfect, like, like Jesus, but at least we can strive and improve the, you know, the people will look, improve and, and you know, the, the people will look to our example, like the early and some heroes and some leaders, and they will see less than fully serious, you know, about the things to be done to be a true leader. So, uh, so each of us has more opportunity, you know, to do well and to to be good, and we are used this opportunity lies all around us. So, in First Timothy four twelve, it says, "Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of believer in word, in conversation, and charity, in spirit, in purity." So, uh, like, uh. Here are some, you know, suggestions for improving of the status of a true leader, a structure area with special reference and feedbacks from the late, uh, from the late 60 to 90s uh, leader and it, uh, from, from the modern leaders from different culture, denomination, and from different parts of villages down in place called Mukokchong. So I'll just read it out these uh, points. Uh, and most of the leaders, you know, like I, I have, you know, I have just interviewed them through a, through a, through a phone call and I have uh, interviewed them through in person. So most of them, 90% uh, of them has uh, given this feedback. You know, the first point is to, to improve the status of a true leader in the general awareness is very important. And second point is to improve the presentation of true leader and start respecting each other view and opinion and what is sen sensitizing the younger leader generation and lastly women leaders should be given opportunity thank you okay um thanks Aaron. um so okay can you um uh, just tell us answer a few questions um now sure, uh, yeah so um so in your research like uh, because you've not named the people whom you uh, you know researched like who you contacted so could you just tell us um, like who are these people like um, where they and what they do, you know, you, you if if you don't want to mention the names, like if they didn't want names to be uh, mentioned, that's fine. But we just wanted to know, like, who are these people or these leaders whom you contacted, uh, and like what they were doing, you know, um, are they pastors? Are they government workers? Um, like, can you just tell us, like, how many were there, and uh, you know what kind of work they were doing? Yeah. Yeah, overall, I have uh, contacted uh, contacted with uh, thirty leaders, and three, 30, most of them three, were uh, yeah, thirty. Sorry, sorry. Three okay, zero. okay. Yeah. Okay. So most of them are uh, another ch church leaders. They are secular leaders. They are government job holders, hmm. and yeah, and uh, yeah, yeah. That's all. Yeah. So in this thirty, can you just tell me like how many were from the church? How many were from the government, um, like, yes, on, you know, we, because we'd like to know, like, you know, what is the percentage uh, of, uh, you know, in, in each uh, sector, you know, yeah. in each, uh, yeah. Yeah, but uh, only then of them are from, uh, they are ch church leader and reminding is uh, their secular. Yeah, so, yeah, um, yeah. yeah, so what uh, the, okay, so 10, so of this 20, like, um, so what, uh, area where they leaders in, you know, just like you know. Uh, like I mentioned, they are a government job holder in in uh, different parts of uh, you know different parts of area in in the part of uh, Mukokchung and and uh, like I mentioned, uh, like. Like ten of them are the church leader in uh, okay. not only in the area of uh down in in, in in the same villages, but they are the leaders even in some part of India. 
Okay. Okay. So tw ten were church, and the, uh, how many were government leaders? Leaders in the government. The remaining twenty. All twenty. Okay. That's okay. Good. So, um, so in the government, what kind of? Um, so, because we just, I'm just trying to find out, um, you know, what. Uh, what was their level of leadership, right? What was their level of influence? So in the government um, or also in the church, you know, of this, let's say we'll start with the church uh, of these 10 leaders. Um, so uh, what kind of positions or what, what was the, the nature of work? Uh, these 10 leaders, could you tell me? Were they pastors? Were they, you know, deacons or administrative um, you know where they're holding that kind of responsibilities so because it's it's uh, it's important that we you know kind of uh, have that yeah um yeah so uh these 10 leaders uh like only three of them are mm. pastor yeah. and the remaining are they they are just you know serving yeah they, they, they are just a member so Mm. Yeah. So, what would qualify them them as leaders? The balance uh, seven in the church. What yeah. would qualify them? Like, why did you choose them to study uh, about uh, you know leadership? Because um, they are regular. They they, are, they usually used to attend the church regularly, and they and somehow they were saying that when. The church leaders are not at a station. They used to take up the fellowship, or they used to take up the church service. So they, okay. so I, I choose them. You, yeah. Okay. No. Uh, so, uh, were they, so they were like assisting the pastor in serving in the church. Yes, pastor. Is that right? Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they were like lay leaders, as you would call them. Okay. Okay. Fine. So, um, yeah. So. Uh, I, I see your, um, I'm just trying to, okay, so this is in Mokokchung town, okay, and all were from Mokokchung town and, and some villages, right, okay. Um, yeah. Now, uh, in your, I'm just going through your report. Now, in, in the report, is there a table with, uh, you know, the the percentages you you got one analysis right which says yes no yes, no idea yes, the yeah. frequency but is there something which um, which gives that all the questions you know um, because you you yeah. have a questionnaire so is there some table which has captured yeah. all the t questions <clears throat> no um, like you no, have no about... no Pasi, it's just that the table i mm. i've just okay. added the table in uh... Mm, because you have about 14 questions, right? Um, so in that 14 yeah, yeah, questions. Um, okay, so that has not captured all the 14. Okay, I see. Fine. Okay. So, yeah. So what would you say uh, was the, uh, you know, maybe you can just talk about uh, um, two problems or two negatives that uh, that came out of the research you know something that was not there and uh, what you would personally recommend uh, for you know future leaders uh, the negative things that i have uh, like while i'm researching while i'm uh, just having right. a personal contact with them the ne yeah. negative is that uh like i'm not against any church leaders or anyone okay but uh the negative thing what i saw in them mm -hmm. is that uh like they're just doing the daily schedule no like if they are pastors if if they are you know uh government job holders they're just doing the regular like they're, they're just doing the regular uh you know uh, job but uh they are not you know, they're not very serious about what is meant by the true leader, you know. So mm. uh, what I thought, and uh, I didn't tell them directly, but what I need, what I want them to change in their life, and as well as us, is that uh, 
we don't have to do, you know, if we are a job holders or if you, if we are a worship leader or, or if we are a pastors, but uh, we need to do it, you know, like with integrity, you know, like, uh, like, uh, like, how can I say it is uh, like our character, you know, pastor, our mm. character is very important because mm. like if, when, when I was, you know, interviewing, uh, well, when I was just talking with them, you know, chatting with them, what I saw is that, uh, like, especially the secular leaders, you know, they're very, you know, they're very harsh. Mm. You know, uh, like, they respond, you know, not comparing with the uh, true leader. Mm. So, uh, like, yeah, uh, like, our character is very important mm. as a leader. So, that's what I, so. Okay. Okay, fine. So uh, you mentioned that your research methodology was uh, through this questionnaire, and uh, uh, and also, like, uh, did you send them the questionnaire, or was it through a yeah. personal interview, or uh, what were the? No, methods I just used? Uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, so I I send the questionnaires. I just. Uh, just send send them out the questionnaire and let them fill that fourteen questions. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. Fine. Okay, Erin. Thank you so much. Thank you for Thank the you presentation. Master. Okay. Right. Okay. So uh, maybe the next person can share. Uh, so we're going alphabetical order. So next is uh, Dave. So Dave, you can, if you're ready, you can just, you can try it out. And then once you're ready, we'll start. Yes, Pastor. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor, especially for this time. Yeah. Uh, Dave, one second. So do you, do you have a PowerPoint? Yeah, I do. I do. You, okay. Why, why don't you just try it out? So. Okay. And then you can um, yeah, simultaneously talk. Yeah. And I'll start the timer once you start the PowerPoint. Get that sorted. OK. Uh, okay can, you, can you see it? Yeah, yeah, you can see. OK. okay shall I start the time now? Sure, Pastor. OK. Yeah, please go ahead. OK. Um, I, I would like to um, start by giving thanks to a pastor and also to APC and DC for, for this opportunity. And, and the topic I'm going to be speaking today is Christianity in Nepal. Um, so, so what we'll discuss is um, the past. And I've divided this past into three different pages and some, some important personnel, events, and organizing that, um, that we're here to, to help Establish the Christianity and uh, growth, bring growth to the the Christianity, and we'll move on to the the present and um, and how it goes to the future, and then the factors that are that are contributing to that were contributing to uh, the growth of Christianity and some challenges, and then we will will end the in the in the um, slides. The the first thing is the past. Yeah. And the first era of the past one is I've named I've in, named it as uh, introductory phase because um, as we can see Nepal was first divided into very small little kingdoms it was not an a whole big nation it was a very small uh, nation and uh, it, there were many different uh, small small kingdoms uh, which were divided and scattered all over and because of this uh, especially when we are talking about the the, the the capital of nepal um it was ruled by uh, a dynasty called malla so because of this malla kings uh, they were very uh, very impressed by the british and impressed by the english who were uh, ruling, uh, I mean, when India was under un, under the British, and the first time we, in Nepal, when when it was recorded that 
um, arrival of a Jew, Jesuit priest, a father, uh, Jesuit priest, a father, whose name was John Leverell. And he arrived in Nepal on 1628. But his intention was not to be in Nepal. Actually, he was going through, uh, going to, to Tibet for, for God's work. But he came down to Nepal. And then from Nepal, they wanted to go down to India. So while, because of this, they somehow wanted to stay in Nepal and they wanted to do work in Nepal. So on, on the 17th century, first of 17th century, a Capuchin order priest started their first permanent mission in Nepal. Um, actually, they were all Catholic. The first person who bring to brought gospel into Nepal was was Catholic fathers. And and uh, because of this, they were people were going to um, growing because they they had uh, their focus was to serve the people, to give medicine to the people, and and to take care of those people. So people began to come uh, know about the gospel and then uh, people were growing. But by the mid of 1700s, um, a king called Prithvi Narayan Sah, he united Nepal and he brought all the smaller kingdom into, into a, a, a single whole uh, nation. And then because of him, um, Christianity, uh, the first fathers um, and, the, and the, the Christians were, were, they were persecuted and even um, at the uh, mid of mid of seventeen uh, hundreds, they were actually kicked out of Nepal, and then along with the Christians, um, Nepali Nepali who were converted, they were they also had to leave country. So they they left Nepal and went to India and never came back again. Um, in in the eyes of in the eyes of um, these first um, kings and um, the British. Uh, the Christians were, they thought the Christians are helping the British to come and rule over Nepal. So they did, they set the whole country for all the foreigners. And the second phase is the foundation phase. And for, as I've written here, for 200 years, Nepal remained shut. There was no, no gospel at all. Uh, it was shut because what I've just told you, if they saw foreigner, they thought, they were bringing Christianity. Um, they thought the Christians had uh, allied with the British to uh, to to spy over Nepal and give information to Brit to the to the foreigners. That's what they thought. They, so they shut the, the whole country for the foreigners, and no one could come in. And while this dynasty, this um, Sahas were ruling. Uh, Ranas began to come to power. Ranas were not actually kings, but they were kind of um, kind of um, prime ministers uh, who took over the power. Uh, kings were just name namesake, and then um, they ruled over Nepal for about um, almost about a hundred years. Um, but they actually were very close with uh, the, the the British. Some of them went back to. Um, uh, England and they learn about uh, learn about Christianity. They saw the buildings, the structure, infrastructure. They loved it, but but they liked their culture, but they did not um, allow gospel to be in that. In fact, um, one historian uh, recalls that one of the one of the prime minister, a high high post, uh, Ranas, was sick, so he so he had to go to India to to be. Um, to, to be in the hospital and in the hospital uh, on the border of Nepal, uh, somewhere in Roxal, he he accepted Lord and then he came back to Nepal, but he was not very welcome in the in the society. Um, but even though uh, Nepal was such, like I said, um, it it was just a foundation phase for Nepal because in actual Nepal it wasn't anything working out. Uh, regarding gospel, but outside of Nepal, people were preparing to come to Nepal as soon as the door was open. So uh, I have to give uh, shout out to all those people who were at the borders praying day after day uh, for Nepal to be opened. Lots of missionaries from, uh, especially from the Church of 
Scotland. They came down to uh, to Darjeeling and they started uh, ministering to uh, people who are speaking Nepali in Darjeeling. And then they began to come down to the border and they began to pray every day for Nepal to be open. And um, and there is a uh, song even a song is this is the song is called Lord please hear our prayer and let this Nepalese uh, come to the Lord and let the let the Nepal be open for gospel. And and the third phase, uh, namely just the birthing phase. And during this phase, um, um, actually the World War Two has just ended, and Nepal was. Uh, had different contract with the British and the, the Indian army. They took on Nepalese to, to be as their army. So because of this, they, they had that, this uh, opportunity to go to different countries and they, they, they had the exposure to, to hear gospel. And then when they came back, they did bring gospel with them. And they, um, because of lack of documentation, uh, there are no records that, that of, their, of them coming back and starting churches. But as we know, um, they, they came back, it, even though it was uh, illegal in Nepal, but they, they shared with their family uh, and they started to have this fellowship, different fellowship. By then, Nepal, Nepal was, uh, the, the king took the power back and then he overthrew the, the parliament system. And then he, he built a system called Panchayat system. So because of this Panchayat system, the Christians were not able to freely worship in the church again. And, and because of this, they had this many um, persecutions and, and a lot of people had to uh, go to jail and in prison, they, spend, they had to spend in jail. And yeah, it was the persecution, but in this time, uh, the church was growing, even though it was underground, the church was growing. And then in some time they had democracy again, and a new multi-party system in parliament was established. And because of this, the Christianity grew again. And during this time, the churches actually burst, in, mainly in Kathmandu and, and then in Pokhara, and then in the west part, west part of Nepal. Uh, Nepal guns and other different parts of Nepal. The major events as a, and some personals and organizations that contributed was, as I told you before, it was first the Church of Scotland, um, who sent so many missionaries to uh, actually to India, uh, who wanted to go, come to Nepal and do work uh, in Nepal. But, but they were not allowed, so they started a, a mission called Gorkha, Mission and they came down to the border and they prayed, prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. They prayed for Nepal every day. And then the the other um, other event is uh, and this person called Ganga Prasad Pradhan. We know in Calcutta in mid mid of um, 1800s, actually um, William Carey translated first uh, Nepali New Testament, but it is not much uh, recognized in Nepal, and uh, it is not that official in Nepal, even though he did it. But the person who did the whole Bible translation was Ganga Prasad Pradhan, who was actually a Nepali, Nepal, a guy from Nepal, but he had to, because of his family, he went down to uh, Darjeeling, and then he was exposed to, uh, to the gospel. and. In the records, it says that Ganga Prasad Pradhan was the second uh, believer of Darjeeling, and then, and then he, 1914 or 1914, he translated the first Bible. And because of his translation, it was easier for for the gospel to spread. People could take part of the Bible and and, and make it as a track and then hand it over to different people, uh, those who, who were able to read. And then, um, the other other event is. Uh, this few missionaries from Britain and Ireland who established this board, uh, Nepal Evangelistic Board, which is now called uh, International Nepal, uh, Nepal Fellowship. And they were the one who came down to 
Nepal through uh, ambassador of uh, Britain, and they started um, a green pasture hospital, which really helped. Uh, and because of their medical help, and they were able to share God to different people. And then let's talk about uh, United Mission to Nepal. Yeah, I mean, it was also one of the uh, the organization which which brought gospel to Nepal, and not only did they bring gospel, but they kept in so many different mission hospitals. They brought hospitals in Kathmandu, uh, a, a hospital called Katan Hospital, and there's a mission hospital in Tanshan, and there's a hospital in Okhodunga, and they, they they built different schools in Gorkha, uh, and they helped in different rural development. They, they, they did trainings in technical uh, trainings, and they had they built hydro towers in Butuwal, Sangha, and different parts of Nepal. Because of this, uh, they were able to bring Christ. And even today also, they are still here and they are still helping so many different areas. And the other thing that helped gospel grow was uh, parachurch organization, different organizations like Youth with Mission, um, Operation Mobilization, and um, different, um, um, like, um, like Youth for Christ, such organizations who, who combined with church and then they they, they had, uh, they helped to bring so many um, people into Christ as well. And the other main event was, was Ananda Bun Leprosy Hospital. This hospital was built in um, 1957. And this hospital at that time, it was the, the leprosy was very, very um, a disease, a very different, difficult, difficult kind of disease. And because of this, people were losing life. But because of this hospital, they were able to save so many different people. And because of this hospital, many people have come to Christ. And many, uh, even I personally know someone who went through this program and became a doctor now. And he's helping other people, other people to, to other people to uh, not only to have them uh, be healthy, but that have them to bring to uh, Christ as well. And the other phase is present and then to future. We will we will look at our political. Uh, I think that's all. Uh... Yes, time okay. we have uh, but yeah you can just take a minute to finish it uh, yeah i got the time there yeah yes Pastor. so christianity now in nepal is um, uh, because of our country's political situation our christianity is very much based in uh, in in politics uh, because uh, most of the hindu people believe the king to be an um, an avatar of a, of their god but as the king was killed in uh, 20, 2001, um, their hopes are gone. And after 2006, our, our kingdom uh, became a republic. So because of this uh, republic, our kingdom was later announced as a secular country, not no more a Hindu country, but a secular country, which opened the door for many different um, opportunities to come to Nepal. And, and the, the growth of church is massive now church is growing a lot uh, if we look at this graph this graph is just a graph uh, of uh, given by uh, our our government but i know this graph is um, not accurate and we still have yet to come uh, the graph of 2021 uh, because we just had the census a recent few months back because of the covid but we know that the number of christians have grown a lot not only this number, but along with different churches, different. Now there's a lot, so many TV stations, so many radio stations, and so many even uh, theological colleges as well in, in the church. And there, even if, if you talk um, about our, our own church. Dev, I think uh, that's all we have time for the presentation. So um, maybe you can answer a couple of questions. Sure, but, sure. Sorry yeah. About so, yeah, so um, now. So we, we, we started by looking at how the Catholic uh, fathers, the Jesuit fathers and, and some of the other order, they came and um, 
they establish the you know the mainly through um, social work and uh, serving the people so people uh, were exposed to christianity in some sense but um, you know where, where was the gospel being preached around that time where people being born again uh, what is uh, you know in your research did you come across any such information as as far as born again it was it, it is not mentioned in uh, when when the fathers were here okay the, fathers, the, the, the 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 first born again believer was recorded in um in 1950s pastor in the 1950s okay yeah. as late as 1950s is it okay yeah. Yeah. Mm, i see so now um, what is the role of the catholic church in nepal now you know uh, does the catholic church exist do we have still have you know people attending catholic church um, yeah yeah but they do in fact um um like there are a lot of um, if we talk about catholics they are, they have done a very good job um regarding establishing a few few uh, very good institutions like schools and colleges they well reputed schools and colleges and um they have done a great a good work in the education sector and there are few churches um in the valley and out of valley as well some some of them has even gone to uh, different remote areas and like in the early um, after the king died uh, there was an uh, an an attack in a catholic church mm -hmm. so in in the valley in the Kathmandu. okay so, so they still are operating and they still are yeah have the thing okay okay so now um uh, you uh, you'd also mentioned about the church of scotland and how um, they um, you know shared the gospel and the church uh, grew and all that so now uh, in the present uh, situation and how things are the present political situation um you know how um, do you think should the churches uh, like share the gospel you know there is of course an anti conversion law um you know uh, so how do you how do how do churches share the gospel now and how do you think that churches should actually do it is uh... yes pastor so the thing is uh, we we obviously cannot go now uh, open to on the roads to share gospel and we 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 can't even have an impression of uh, impression trying to share gospel but the, the thing we can do is because of the, the anti-conversion law, what we can do is we can invite people as much as we can, either to church or to our own own place. And then then we we directly cannot share the gospel, but we can mm -hmm. share our experience, what yeah. God has done in our life and what what God can do to their to their life as well. Mm -hmm. So how is that how it's happening right now in Nepal? Is that how gospel is being shared? Yes, Pastor. Mostly, uh, yeah, mostly in the 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 rural areas, people can yeah. share it or do anything. But in the urban areas, people mostly do like like this. Like even um, like, yeah, uh, even some there are some few TV programs, but mm -hmm. they cannot directly share gospel. Um, but they kind of share like like some cartoons to kids and then along with that share something uh, uh, something that is good in moral which is connected to the bible yeah okay okay fine okay Dave. thank you so much thank you thank for you the presentation. sorry for the time yeah, yeah no problem um yeah so yeah i think that's all we have time for uh, for the next uh, just one second let me just uh, stop the recording